Hello, friends, and welcome to the March 16th edition of Weekly Witness, Texas Impact's weekly opportunity for mainstream Texans of faith to learn about policy issues here in our great state and have a conversation about how you can engage in that process. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Director of Public Witness, and we have an exciting episode for you today as we welcome Issa Peterson to the program. Issa is Texas Impact's Hunger Fellow through the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and is the lead author of Texas Impact's new publication, Light and Life, using the Public Utility Commission of Texas Sunset Review to safeguard Texans' health and well-being. She'll join us today to talk about that publication and why it's so timely right now. We'll also be joined by Kara Cook from the National Association of Nurses for Healthy Environments to discuss the connection between climate and health a topic that's getting more and more attention recently. On this week's watch list, Josh is watching election recounts and news about refugee resettlement. And to kick us off, we'll begin with weekly word from Abel Vega, Director of Mission, Service, and Justice Ministries with the Rio Texas Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. But before we get to the program, I want to share a couple of quick thoughts at the top. First, thanks as always to all who've reached out in response to our recent episodes. We love to get your comments, questions, and suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. I'll be looking for your emails at scott at texasimpact.org. And help us out by subscribing, sharing, and inviting a friend to listen. So depending on where you are in Texas, it's spring break season. And I hope you get a chance to disconnect and enjoy some wonderful spring weather. Because we could all use a short break from the news cycle. And I got to spend a brief but wonderful mini vacation with my wife and kids. And it reminded me, we do this work because we care about the state and the world and our loved ones who live in it. Work is already underway to prepare for the 2023 Texas legislature, and polling shows that many Texans think that the legislature still needs to do a lot more to ensure our electric grid and other public utilities are safe, reliable, and affordable. And there's an opportunity to do something about it, because this year, the Public Utility Commission of Texas and several other natural resources and utility agencies are going through their reauthorization process. So it's a great time to consider how public utilities literally mean life or death, especially for vulnerable people. It's pretty simple. People depend on electricity for home medical devices. They need clean water to live. They need broadband to know when to evacuate in a hurricane. And those are just a couple of examples. I know you're already thinking of more. If anyone tries to tell you how complex and difficult the issues are, tell them. Safeguarding Texans' health isn't a complicated policy position, and it shouldn't be controversial. Check out ESA's report at texasimpact.org or on our social media, and keep an eye out for ways you and your congregations can engage in the sunset process. So with that, here we go. The Weekly Word with Abel Vega. I am amazed, troubled, and in a state of wonderment during these times of living through the COVID pandemic and all the challenges that come from this reality. On top of this, we are amid times that are perplexing in terms of the complexities of issues and finding responsible ways to respond. Being part of the ministries of mission, service, and justice for the church, the church is guided by scripture that offers God's hope for all creation and humanity, called to care for all that God has created. As I continue to work and learn through the complexities of our times and how I, as a disciple of Jesus and called to respond, I am coming to the conclusion that, that, there, that there are three foundational areas people of faith are called to respond to. One is creation and climate justice. Another is global migration of peoples in the world. And a third is vital condition, health conditions of communities. In a recent conversation with the pastor, we concluded that addressing creation and climate justice is at the heart of root causes affecting the other two areas. There is much for the church to engage in as an instrument of grace, healing, shalom, and justice in the world and specifically in the Texas region of the world. Essentially addressing climate justice, global migration, and vital health conditions of communities is certainly pertinent 
to the communities we serve. I often think of Jesus's words where he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And oh, how true and needed is that for us today. Our challenges as people of faith may be to, number one, be willing to seek the truth of these matters. And secondly, respond as God's instruments of healing, justice, and liberation for these times. Scripture tells us in Genesis 1 that God saw everything that God had made, and indeed it was very good. In Isaiah 24, he says that, The earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth, the earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. In Mark 12, we are commanded that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. And the second is this, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, and that there is no other commandment greater than this. So this gets interesting because in the complexities of these issues, I was reading an article that spoke about the first language of the United States is individualism and the second is community. And in these times we are in, When we think about creation justice, when we think about global migration, when we think about vital health conditions of communities in these times of pandemic, even more so, the language of community is needed greater than the language of individualism. So therefore we are challenged, I believe, but not all hope is lost because as people of faith, we have an opportunity to model what God calls us to be in the world. As A United Methodist, our social principles state, all creation is the Lord's and we are responsible for the ways in which we use and abuse it. Water, air, soil, minerals, energy, resources, plants, animal life, and space are to be valued and conserved because we are God's creation and not solely because we are useful. They are useful to human beings. As people of faith, may we continually lean into seeking and responding to the truth as God's instruments of healing, justice, and liberation for these times. This week's episode of Weekly Witness was brought to you by Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas and the COVID Collaborative. Joining us for today's conversation is my friend and colleague, Isa Peterson. Isa, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm good. And I love that you asked that because when Texas Impact staff come on, I usually have to ask how people are feeling. Uh, But I'm doing well. It's spring break and my birthday week, so exciting times. Mm -hmm. Uh, How are you? I'm doing good. It's uh, not too hot and not too cold in Texas, so all is good. Just right. Excellent. So Isa, you've been with the Texas Impact team since late last year working on this project that we're going to talk about today. Uh, But why don't you take a second at the top to tell listeners a little bit about yourself and what brings you to Texas Impact? Yeah, absolutely. I joined Texas Impact back in early September as the Hunger Advocacy Fellow with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and they kind of sponsor that program here. There's a couple of us across the state. I know some people are in Washington, but me specifically, I come from a sustainability and government background, so I got to really bring that into the work here and focus on climate justice work, especially, and into this project that we're about to talk about. So ELCA friends, make sure that you are sharing this content, right? We've got one of your own here here, uh, (laughs) helping us out. So Issa, let's jump right in. Uh, The last couple of weeks, I think uh, many people's minds have been focused on Ukraine and the Texas primaries and maybe the unnecessary political posturing that came with that. Uh, But prior to that, Texans were worried about whether or not the lights would stay on after the Mm -hmm. the storm that we had last year, uh, which ties into the publication that you've been working on. So tell us a little bit about that publication. 
Yeah, exactly. We're all really super excited about it. And it's a primer called Light and Life using the Public Utility Commission of Texas Sunset Review to safeguard Texans' health and well-being. It is a really large overview into the intersection between public health and public utilities from electricity, water, and broadband. So I heard you refer to it as a primer. Why is that? Yeah, so we kind of did that very intentionally because we wanted to introduce the topic of public health and public utilities to Texas voters. Public utilities and public health especially are pretty specialized and complex policy areas. So we wanted to give people something that was digestible and really accessible so the information is easily readily able to kind of, you know, give out to the community members and share that information without feeling too overwhelmed. Well, it, it is really important work. So talk to us about, and I certainly like things that are simple because this is a, <laughs> a very complex, uh, complex issue. So what kind of research did you do in preparing the report? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, it is a super complex topic. And so it kind of started back last fall. I did a lot of early initial groundwork research into the policy areas, also focusing on different types of energy production. So a lot of kind of hands-on work on my, st- on my part for initially. But then we got into this really big, large collaborative effort where we got different energy experts and health experts across the state to really give us additional factual information and make sure that we're kind of going in the right direction. I actually would like to highlight some of the people that helped us out a lot because we had some big players that really are super impactful into this project. One of them is Kara Cook from the Alliance of Nurses from Healthy Environments. Another one, Ankit Sangavi with Texas Health Institute. And with the energy experts, we have two really well-known state energy experts, Michael Jewell and Colin Meehan. So it was really great and beneficial to have that additional expert <laughs> analysis and evaluation because it really made this primer as effective as possible. Yeah, and some weekly witness favorites out there. I know Ankit has been on. Uh, Kara will be joining us. Uh, later today for the conversation. So I think it's important that you talk to us about the research that you've done. It's important to talk about uh, the people who've been involved in the process, but I think the most important thing for our listeners might be the top line conclusion. So uh, walk us through those. Yeah, no, absolutely. The top line, like what I want people to take away is that public utilities are very, very connected to public health. And a lot of people just don't realize it. It's kind of overlooked. So when people, especially Texans, think about health and health equity, you know, they think about health care providers, insurance or personal choices, you know, healthy eating, exercise, things along those lines. But they don't necessarily think about electricity or water, but especially broadband, too. But after Winter Storm Yuri, Texans have truly realized that public utilities can be a matter of life and death. Public utilities are usually very insider focused. The stakeholders are people who make the money and make decisions and spend the money. And so the decision and the power is kind of all of there in their control. And while it's important to have that kind of the commission making those decisions, they need to take into account public health as a priority. And so it's a really important objective to include public health into the statement. And our report really focused on several recommendations about how lawmakers can connect public health into public utility regulations and ultimately the decisions that they're making. So, for example, first of all, we recommend that legislators include public health into the mission statement, the PUCT and ERCOTS. And we also recommend that they center public health in the voices and around the commission and the agencies by creating a consumer advisory council. And lastly, a super integral one that's kind of very important to me is recommending that lawmakers make the agencies conduct a health impact analysis before they take any action or make any rules. And that's a super integral aspect that we want to include. So I've read over the recommendations and saw the term health in all policies. Uh, what's that mean? Can you say more about that? Yeah, no, I'm glad that you mentioned that because health in all policies is truly an amazing concept that was pretty foreign to me before I started this project. Essentially, it's an approach to policy that centers human health of both families, individuals, and communities at the forefront of public policy decisions because decisions in every area of public policy can truly impact human health for better or worse. And those policy decisions, especially at the Public Utility Commission, can potentially improve or hurt human health, as we saw during Winter Storm Yuri. I was also interested to see broadband in the report. I think I and many listeners probably don't typically think of internet as a public utility. So can you talk about how that's related? 
Yeah, I, that's definitely one that is super unique and that can often be overlooked. But through my research, I found that it's a super determinant of health because in an increasingly more modern society, so many aspects of our society are connected to internet and broadband access, including education, work opportunities, healthcare, especially telehealth. You know, we had COVID-19 pandemic that hit communities really hard, but for communities that live in digital deserts, areas that don't have broadband access, whether that's from a lack of affordability or a lack of infrastructure, don't have the opportunity to participate in telehealth options, and they're truly kind of cut off and disconnected from the rest of society. Through my research, I found that 1.6 million households, not even individuals, households in Texas don't have internet access. That means now and during the pandemic, those individuals could not use telehealth medicine, and they didn't have the opportunity to try to get different access to resources and educational opportunities. And it's just an area that needs to be focused on more. Yeah. And, and we all saw that during, uh, mm -hmm. during the COVID pandemic, right? It was, it was no problem uh, for me to start working from home. I mean, I miss seeing your face in the office and that kind of thing, <laughs> but like we had internet access, we could certainly do that. Uh, my kids could do school at home with no problems. Uh, but I think we all know people who struggled during that time. Uh, and many of our congregations were, uh, we're trying to figure out how to respond to the needs of their local communities, how to how to help kids get access. And so uh, we all lived through that. We all saw it. And it seems like something that we should be thinking about moving forward. Uh, so, Issa, I'm going to ask you to, to sell us a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I, I know we talked talked offline earlier that you love selling. Right. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, there are a lot of things that are on the front pages of newspapers. There are a lot of things that are in our hearts and um, and challenges that we're seeing every day. But this is important, right? And so why is it especially important that people pay some attention to what's going on uh, here in Texas related to uh, public utilities and public health? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's a really important time right now because the PUCT and ERCA are about to undergo sunset review, which is Texas's state agency reauthorization process. Sunset is a, it's a really detailed look at every aspect of how an agency functions and operates and what its responsibilities are or even challenges. So it's a really perfect time to refocus and recenter public health into the conversation and try to make sure that PUCT is worried and focused on strengthening Texans' health, not just creating big energy profits or working on different regulations, but ensuring that public health and human well-being is at the front and center of all decisions. And for longtime Weekly Witness listeners and members of Texas Impact, you've heard us talk about Sunset before. And you know, Issa just said it, once every decade, we have an opportunity to change policy, to weigh in, to make recommendations on how state agencies and policy is made in a particular area. And so, y'all, this is the time for uh, the Public Utility Commission. This is the time uh, to, to weigh in on these different issues. Um, so, Issa, I guess that, that leads to the next question. Uh, what do you hope people will do with this publication? What homework assignments do you have for us? Yeah. Absolutely. First off, I would love if everyone read the report. It was a, <laughs> Step <laughs> it was one, a big, read the yeah, report. Read the report. Step one. It was a big collaborative effort, but it was also a really big project that I had a big personal challenge of mine. And I'm really proud to see how far it's come and that the impact that it can potentially have. Right. But another thing that I would like people to take note of is that when they first read the report or look through it, that they keep an open mind and keep an eye out for different perspectives or different ideas that they may have not known of before, maybe not thought about. For example, we talk about how a lot of vulnerable communities are affected, especially people in healthcare sectors or disability, disabled communities, or even low income communities that have different challenges than maybe people you know of, or maybe that are in your own household. So it's really eye opening to see how different communities are affected by public utilities and public health. And so I really just want people to take an open perspective and see what they can learn and take away from it on an individual level. And then, so step one, read the report. Step two, consider how these issues play in our local communities. And I assume step three will be uh, take some opportunity to make public comment or weigh in on the process. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In the report, we do definitely have that information included. And also keep an eye on Texas Impact's websites and tweets and social media, because I know that 
personally, I'll be working on stuff later and when we get towards the time in April and we releasing information about how to keep a hands-on process in the sunset hearing process and how we can all be a strong leading voice because I already know we already have some interests with other organizations and people in the community. So that's a big prog project we're looking forward to also. Yeah, so the homework assignment for today is read the report and start to familiarize <laughs> yourself with the issues. Step two will be in the weeks and months to come, pay attention to the ask from Texas Impact and our partners about how you can engage in the process because this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of work between now and the, the beginning of the next Texas legislative session in 2023 uh, to really start pushing these issues, right? Yeah, absolutely. We want to use this primer as not only inf informational, but a, a leaping point, a starting point for more physical action and legislative change. So that's definitely what we're looking for. Issa, as we get close to wrapping up, I know at the beginning you mentioned the term sustainability. This is something you've studied. This is something uh, you hope to be doing uh, moving forward. What does that term mean to you and why did you choose to focus on that area of study? Yeah, I specifically chose sustainability because of the, ra the variety of stakeholder perspectives it takes into account when you're evaluating any challenge, whether it be purely environmentally focused or economic challenge or even housing issues because it ties into a concept called the three big E's um, in which stand for environmental, equity, and economics. So it really takes it into account that you're evaluating different focuses of a challenge instead of just focusing too much on one area. For example, when I worked in environmental nonprofits, we were definitely heavily focused in an environmental area, but maybe we didn't take into account people at too much at times. But this report, what I loved about working on this project is that I got to embody every aspect of those three E's and incorporate the entirety of what sustainability truly means. And so it was a really great project for me personally because I got to take the entirety of my degree and kind of put it all into this primer. And so it was a really hands-on area to get environmental equity and economics all embodied into a 40-page plus docket. So it was awesome. Well, Issa, on, on behalf of all of us, uh, it you have done some incredible work uh, on this project, and I, I just want to say thanks on behalf of the entire Texas Impact team and our our, our listeners. Uh, thanks for doing this work. I hope people will take full advantage of it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to leave us with today? Um, I, I would like to see how I would like readers what to say sustainably means to them. I would like to know. That's a fun question. I think people don't think about too often because sustainability can look differently depending on what level you look at, and so. Uh, that's a food for thought. I would love what people know and see what sustainability kind of what's around in their community that embodies sustainability, reminds them of sustainability. So I'd say go with that in mind. <laughs> All right. Issa, thank you so much for the time today. And thanks for the incredible work on this publication. Thanks. <laughs>Josh, I know a lot of people like to make jokes about me asking you about your feelings on these podcasts, and I'll just have to say, Issa, in the last segment, asked me about my feelings, and it made me feel warm inside. So I won't ask you about your feelings, but how's your spring break going? It's going all right. It's going pretty well. Good. The weather is nice outside. We've had a chance to get out, um, but I assume nobody wanted to tune in today to hear us talk about the weather. So let's jump right in. Uh, what are you watching this week? Yeah, I'm watching two things, Scott. I'm watching a recount uh, in a house race that has just been uh, officially requested in Denton County, and I'm watching uh, the situation with the refugees in Ukraine. So talk to us about the uh, recount. What's going on there? Yeah, so House District 64 is in Denton County, uh, and it also is in one neighboring county as well. Uh, in that race, the incumbent Lynn Stuckey uh, is ahead, at least right now, by 88 votes. Uh, the challenger, uh, Andy Hopper, has requested a recount uh, because there were 18,000 votes cast, more than 18,000 votes cast in that race, and it came down to 88 votes. Um, so there are several questions that that brings up um, that we just don't know the answers to that we need to pay attention to. Uh, one, I mean, the biggest one that we think is how does Senate Bill 1 uh, affect that race, if at all. Uh, so for instance, how many mail-in ballots were cast in that race? How many of those mail-in ballots were rejected? We're seeing some very high rejection rates uh, with mail-in ballots. And uh, would that, uh, how did those votes break? Uh, often it's just statistically uh, reflective of the, how the larger vote went. 
Uh, but this one's so close, 88 votes out of 18,000, that, it, that it, it could very well make or break the outcome in that race. Uh, I, we have questions about does it go to litigation? And if it goes to litigation, uh, do the provisions of SB1? So there were a lot of arcane provisions we never really talked about because it had to do with legal procedure uh, but in SB1. Uh, but do those come into play? And then once those are resolved, uh, what's the fallout? Um, does it make legislators behave any better in the 88th, at least behind closed doors? If you have sitting legislators worry about having their own elections uh, overturned uh, or more easily overturned, does that make them behave better uh, when it comes to policy? Or do we hear about it all session long from conspiracy theorists who don't feel like it was resolved uh, adequately or fairly? So those are all important issues. The the <laughs> The thing that comes to mind when you talk about an 88 vote differential, um, in my mind anyway, is that uh, just a reminder that these low turnout elections are especially important. And we have another one coming up in May, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that was 18,000. It sounds like a lot, but you got to realize that each house district represents 190,000 people. Um, you know, so that if well over 100,000 people, the voting age population could have participated in that race and, and uh, very, very few did. I mean, that's one of the higher turnout races uh, that you'll see in a, in a primary. Actually, most of the primaries were, I mean, there was a, a, a very competitive House district race that was about 5,000 votes and it came down to a margin of about 190 people. So just a reminder that we're not talking about elections today uh, in terms of the episode. We just did a, a whole series on that, but Y'all, runoffs are coming up. It's important to be paying attention. Get organized now. Uh, so, Josh, we've talked about the elections a lot recently, but one of the things that everybody's paying attention to right now is the situation in Ukraine. And you mentioned the refugee crisis. What are you watching there? Yeah, I always try to make sure that it pertains to Texas um, because this is our purview. Um, nevertheless, it is challenging for me to take my eyes off the news, and um, it probably is for others as well. Uh, it's a public opinion poll that caught my eye last night from the PBS NewsHour, and I think it's interesting to see that public opinion polls are all over the place right now as people, I think, are reacting uh, understandably emotionally to what is occurring in our world. On the PBS NewsHour last night, though, the question was uh, to Americans, do you think the United States should be accepting refugees fleeing violence in Ukraine? And 54 percent said yes. Uh, which actually was a surprisingly low number, at least in my opinion. Um, 54% is a pretty close majority. We would call that a swing district uh, if it was an election for a, a seat. So uh, I was on a call last week, Scott, uh, with national faith um, organizations, uh, our national folks uh, that we coordinate with, and we were talking about refugee resettlement and how refugee resettlement has just been, the agencies that perform refugee resettlement have just been decimated. Uh, they are paid by the number of people they resettle. And four years, five years ago, it was 120,000 people. And then each successive year, the Trump administration cut the number of people to be resettled in half, kind of year after year after year, until they whittled it down to around 20,000. Uh, that's critical because it's not possible to rebuild that infrastructure overnight. It is possible to rebuild it, but it's going to take a long time to to hire the social workers and train them up on the issues affecting refugee resettlement. Uh, if there's any silver lining, it's that we probably have one to two years uh, before the process of, of accepting refugees in the United States takes a, a very, very long time as we vet uh, the people coming over here. And obviously, the first goal of refugee resettlement is to not resettle somebody, is to get them back to their home country. So you have a very uncertain situation in Ukraine. Uh, it would be probably more than a year before we started to see uh, high numbers um, coming over. So we could get that rebuilt. But the the issue, of course, is public opinion and, and how does this play out politically? Because in Reuters, they reported that, that some of the people with means are going to Mexico, uh, buying a car and beginning to drive across the southern border here in Texas. Um, and it's not just Ukrainians doing that. It's also uh, Russians. Uh, and so even uh, so that's kind of the big question, right, is how far does our sympathy uh, and how far does our empathy and sympathy go? Because a number of those Russians that are doing it are political dissidents. They're uh, facing uh, repression in their home country and seeking asylum. 
uh, through the legal way, if you will, of, of coming across the border through a, uh, through a, a, a legal checkpoint and, and then presenting for asylum. And so I think the big macro question is, is, is does the situation in Ukraine reset the narrative around refugees? Um, because we know how that narrative went when it was Syria just uh, eight, seven years ago. Uh, so it's not encouraging, especially that that number is is only 54 percent, a a very thin majority uh, support resettling even Ukrainians uh, in the United States. Well, Josh, those are definitely important things to be watching. I hope you are able to watch some sunlight this week during spring break, and I look forward to talking with you again next week. All right, see you, Scott. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome to the conversation my new friend, Kara Cook, with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Uh, Kara, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So first, why don't you tell us about the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments so our listeners know who you are and who you're with. Absolutely. So I work for an organization called the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm also a nurse myself. And our organization is a nursing organization that's focused specifically on the intersection of human health and the environment. And so we work with a number of nurses across the country, as well as nursing organizations to raise awareness on how environmental factors influence health and also to move forward with policy change that creates healthier environments, as well as practice change within nurse practice settings. Well, I have to tell you, uh, my wife is a nurse and we're going to have to have a conversation when I get home about your organization. So maybe you'll yeah, have a new fan join. coming soon. Uh, so uh, we're coming to you. We're, we're having this conversation after you just presented at the Texas United Methodist Women's Legislative uh, event. And I know you talked about the idea that Texans should especially be uh, paying attention uh, to this important issue. Um, why is that? Why should Texans care? Yeah, I mean, if you if we think about climate impacts, Texas is one of the states that is set to be the most impacted and is already experiencing impacts now. Um, and so that means that we need to be preparing for the health impacts related to climate exposures and being able to set forth um, interventions and policy change that helps protect people in the um, event of worsening climate change, which we are seeing. I think it's it's fair to say the Texans of faith, uh, I would hope all Tex or all, <laughs> all Texans and all people of faith, uh, have a special heart for low-income communities. Uh, how do climate-related impacts disproportionately impact those communities? Yeah, so um, low-income communities um, are often in areas that are experiencing more extreme climate risks. So whether they're in low-lying areas that are more prone to flooding or living near heavy industries. And so if they're located on the coast where there's hurricanes or storm surges, there's a risk of um, contamination and pollution in their communities from that kind of intersection of climate change, as well as they generally just live in areas um, that are more polluting for a number of reasons. Um, in addition to them being um, more exposed, we also know that low-income communities are less likely to have the resources to be able to protect themselves. Um, so if there is a climate-related event that requires evacuation, oftentimes the, the folks who don't have the resources to do so aren't, supposed, aren't able to leave, and that puts them at an increased risk. I know, like... The biggest example I can think of of that would be Hurricane Katrina, right? And we, where I live, we ended up with a lot of people from there. But are there other examples of, of times where that might have happened? Yeah. Um, so I think we saw examples of it in um, Hurricane Harvey, particularly in Houston. Um, that whole area along the coast is just, you know, um, oil and gas corridor, as well as home to many industries. In um, those communities, what ended up happening is um, before the hurricane, many of the oil and gas facilities or, or whatever industry operations had to um, shut down a little bit or decrease their operations. So they end up putting out a lot of pollution during that. And so we saw increases in air pollution. Um, we also saw um, with the floodwaters actually were going into those um, industrial areas. And so we had risk of contamination for those living near heavy industry as one example. 
So one of the other things I recently heard you talk about was that uh, the the root causes of climate change also kind of individually uh, impact health. Um, did, did I get did I get that right? And what yeah. does that look like? Yeah. So we know fossil fuels are the major driver of climate change. Um, so that's one way they impact health, but they also create a number of health impacts just in general. Um, and the one kind of upside is that is that once we start to implement climate solutions, we can actually see immediate effects to health. So, for example, if we're transitioning away from fossil fuels to clean energy, we see um, just you know reductions in air pollution and water pollution as a result of those polluting industries decreasing, and we're transitioning to the um, cleaner sources of energy. Kind of this entire uh, issue um, of, of climate of of the environment really speaks a lot to health disparities. And we did a a big series um, a year or two ago on health disparities in Texas, but uh, any idea of what that looks like in Texas or any, any examples that you can think of? Yeah. um, So when we think about um, health disparities, um, one of the biggest things is oftentimes the zip code is the biggest predictor of health outcomes. And so there's a number of um, health disparities that relate to where people are living, where they're working, um, their social circumstances, their economic status, um, as well as um, systems and and historical policy that have um, put people in the positions that they are today. For example, racism is one of the reasons that um, some communities of color are more impacted by um, climate risks just because of, um, you know, historical policies that made it so um, certain communities haven't been able to accumulate generational wealth or had their communities split apart um, and and really had kind of um, uh, perhaps some industries coming in and targeting those communities. Um, which in turn has created, you know, they have environmental risks just within the heavy industry there. And then you have on top of it climate risk. And so health disparities are a big um, uh, thing to think about in terms of who is most impacted and um, how risk varies between people and populations. So over the course of the last two years, for sure. (laughs) We've been thinking a lot about how COVID-19 and how pandemics have impacted uh, the healthcare system. But climate change does the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Talk some about that. And if there are some specific examples, you get bonus points. (laughs) I think what we've really witnessed um, during COVID-19 is kind of what climate change could Im- look like really unchecked, kind of a, a look into our future. Um, because we saw we see many similarities in terms of whether a hospital is prepared to care for people, whether it be for the pandemic or from an extreme weather event. And we also seen um, the concern with health disparities and how um, certain um, groups have experienced either um, higher rates of COVID infection or higher um, rates of severe outcomes from COVID. And that has related to um, some of the same health disparities that we see with climate change. And so when we think about, um, oh yeah, so um, specifically when we think about the um, winter storm, we saw that um, health care facilities really struggled to be able to care for the number of patients coming into the emergency room because they lost power at home and they needed access to medical care um, or they didn't have running water or they lost power. Those are big things that can uh, make it so a healthcare system uh, is unable to deliver care. Uh, in addition, um, during the winter storm, we saw that um, the pandemic had impacts. Um, the healthcare system was already strained from the from COVID nineteen, and so when you add on these double burdens of climate disasters, COVID nineteen, um, you know the winter storm, everything is ex- um, exacerbated. And unless a hospital is prepared for that, um, it's really kind of a, a case between a hospital having to close down or a hospital being able to care for the people. So I guess the question is, like, number one, that's terrifying, right? And, and we all experienced the winter storm last year. Uh, I, I, 
you know, Houston area, I've, I've forgotten the exact stat, but I think we had 300 year floods in four years or something like that, which makes me think that maybe we need to start renaming what is a hundred year flood. But, uh, you know, we have all those going on while there's a pandemic where people aren't supposed to be close to each other. Mm-hmm. So, so what are we going to do about this? What are your suggestions? Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. I, I don't think, um, when we think about our response to COVID, COVID, we've, it's been very isolated and just dealing with this pandemic. But when we ha- we need to think about it from a bigger picture, once you know the um, once we get over the hump of having to deal with the immediate impacts of COVID, um, I think there's you know a lot of lessons learned that we can take from this pandemic and apply it to climate change. Um, we also saw that. Um, you know, because people are actually staying home. Um, you know, we saw reductions in air pollution because of tra- less traffic. And so we can see how that has benefits for people, but we never want to um, have a pandemic to, to, you know, make people drive less or, <laughs> right. or do whatever. But we need to start thinking about how do we have um, things in place? Like how do we move to clean energy? How do we have different ways to move people around? All ways that make people healthier and at the same time address climate change. So, you know, our our audience includes faith leaders and Texans of faith. Is there anything in particular that you can think of that the faith community can do uh, to support the work that that you're interested in? Yeah, I think the the faith community is particularly trusted in in many different communities. And so I think that is um, holds a lot of value in the way we talk about climate change with people um, because of the faith community being so trusted and having folks come into um, congregations and churches, there's a, a unique audience that you're able to reach. And I think even just having conversations, it doesn't have to be about climate change. It can be about you know, um, how to protect the low income residents in your community or how to protect against water pollution. I think there's different ways to talk about these issues. And I think the faith voice is incredibly powerful in doing so. Any, uh, we're, we're going to be encouraging our folks to talk to their legislators throughout the course of the year. Um, anything you think they should be talking to them about? I think talking about these issues from the health perspective can be really powerful. I think with the, um, you know, what's coming up with the sunset process, health is going to be a big component of right. that. I know people are angry about what happened. Uh, people unnecessarily relating were to the winter storm. Right? Yeah, relating yeah. to the winter storm. People are unnecessarily harmed, um, and I think that is going to be a big driver in in how state agencies change and respond to that because no one wants another storm like that and the impacts that happened from that and we know with climate change that's a a risk to happen and and agencies need to prepare all right well uh kara i really appreciate the time today and i really appreciate uh you for the work you're doing every day i'll give you a chance before we close out any shameless plugs you'd want to leave us with today um no i just i would love to collaborate more with um, you know, faith organizations, our organization works with a number of um, uh, different organizations on climate issues, on environmental issues. So always here if anyone wants to, um, you know, work on an issue or needs, um, you know, a nursing voice there, always happy to help. All right. And where do we find you for more information? You can go to our website, which is envirn.org. And we are the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Well, nurses are some of my favorite people. Uh, I married one, uh, and especially over the last two years, man, y- y'all have y'all have been heroes. Uh, so thank you so much, and thanks for this conversation today. We certainly have a lot of work to do going forward. Thank you so much. Thanks. I want to thank our guests today, Abel Vega, Issa Peterson, Josh Houston, and Kara Cook. But I especially want to thank you for tuning in. To reiterate what I said at the top, There's a lot going on in the world right now. And on top of that, we have the important work of policymaking in Texas and runoff elections coming up soon. So I hope that means that more than ever, Texans of faith are needed to bring voices of sanity to the political discourse. We have important content in this episode that I hope you'll share with your friends and congregations as we prepare to engage in the policy process this spring and summer. I hope you'll spend some time this week thinking about how you can engage in this process. And with that, it's time to draw this episode to a close. If you've stayed with us this long, you must have enjoyed the content, so I hope you'll share it with your friends and congregations and leave us a rating or review. 
That way, even more of your friends can find us and join in the movement for justice in Texas. And there's a lot going on. So keep an eye on Texas Impact social media for upcoming announcements or email me at scott at texasimpact.org with questions. And remember, if you appreciate Texas Impact and the Weekly Witness community, please make sure that you and your congregation are members of Texas Impact by going to texasimpact.org. Friends, these are wild times, and 2022 is an important year for democracy, our planet, and our communities. More than ever, the world needs Texans of faith active and engaged. So let's get to work. Weekly Witness is hosted by Scott Atnick, engineered and produced by David Fasalo. Our executive producer is B. Moorhead. The opinions expressed on Weekly Witness are those of Texas Impact and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of our sponsors. Weekly Witness is a product of Texas Impact, people of faith working for justice. Visit us online at texasimpact.org.